Great, thank you. So as I said, for most people who are members of the LNHS, Tristan Banter will always already be very familiar to you. He's our wonderful Hemiptera recorder. He's also the field organizer of the field meetings for the ecology and entomology section. He's somebody who's got a back, really strong background in both ecology and natural history. And he's knowledgeable about the whole of entomology, really. But his real specialism is in the hemiptera. That's his specialist interest. He's involved with um, organising the, the shield bugs and allies with national recording scheme. And he's obviously the recorder for that group for the LHS as well. He's somebody who works as a professional entomologist. He regularly contributes to a range of publications, including British Wildlife. So I'm sure people will have seen his kind of entries in that. And he's also a really good teacher who's worked that's, I think teaches various organizations, but certainly does some really lovely um, useful sessions for the Field Studies Council. So really delighted to have him um, speak to us. We've been tr trying to twist his arm to do this talk for a couple of years, I think. So I'm really pleased that we've kind of managed to, to do that for 2022. And he's going to talk to us this evening about true bugs of the London area. So over to you now, Tristan. Well, thank you, Maria, for that very nice introduction. Uh, I, shall, uh, I should first of all say that I am struggling with a bit of a cold uh, this evening, so um, I'll do my best. So maybe very slightly shorter than usual if I feel I'm struggling a bit um, with my voice. And um, if I do mute myself, it's probably because I'm having to sneeze or blow my nose or something. But fingers crossed. Uh, they'll all be fine. So yeah, thank you for that lovely introduction. So I'll, I'll share my screen now uh, and hope you can all see that. Is that yep. showing okay? And yeah, that's everyone, fine. Yeah. And the audio yeah, is fine. Yeah, Excellent. it's all fine, Tristan. Thank okay. you. Okay. Right, well, I'm very much aware that there are probably some people uh, listening to this who don't really know very much about Hemiptera at all. So and with that in mind, uh, I think I should start with, with quite a general introduction, really. So first of all, what, what are they? And they're one of the big insect orders in Britain. They're about 2,000 species, and that sort of ranks alongside Lepidoptera on about 2,500 butterflies and moths. Um, but much less than beetles, about 4,000, and, and a lot less than flies, which are about 7,000. But all of them are characterized by the possession of these mouth parts, which are piercing, and they can, they can suck using them. And they use this feeding tube called a rostrum to do that. And they feed on both plant or animal fluids, sometimes both, but usually plant sap, so they're herbivores. Uh, and most of them uh, are associated with plants. So they vary in size from really very, very small, just uh, one or two millimetres to about a couple of centimetres. Obviously, they're much larger uh, abroad, can be much larger. They're found in lots and lots of different habitats, and they really, really like hot habitats and hot situations, microclimates. Uh, and in the tropics, they're a, a massive group and very, very diverse. So here are some examples uh, of bugs, and hopefully in all of them you can see uh, the, the bug using its rostrum uh, to feed. Uh, the two on the left are herbivores, so this is a plant bug feeding on a leaf. Here we've got a leaf hopper. Uh, this is the rostrum under its head piercing the midrib of this leaf. And on the right we've got a uh, damsel bug, this is a predatory species. Uh, here you can see the rostrum. Uh, and it's another predatory species, a predatory shield bug, and this is a spike shield bug feeding on uh, sawfly larva. So you can divide them into three suborders. This was the kind of traditional classification. Uh, and the first of these is the heteroptera, about 600 of them. Most of them are terrestrial, but it does include all the water bugs as well. And it includes some hopefully familiar insects that you're uh, already aware of, like the shield bugs. And this is the common green shield bug here, which uh, is, can be very common in gardens and, and sort of urban situations. Uh, in all the heteroptera, the antennae have four or five similar segments. Uh, and you'll note that the forewings divide into these two regions. So along around the base, they're, they're hardened. Uh, 
and sort of leathery, and then at the tip, they're membranous. And they overlap around this quite big scutellum, or can be quite big in any, in any case. Uh, and you'll note that the wingtips at the end of the, the wings, the membranes, uh, the membranous regions overlie each other. Uh, so you can just see one, one uh, wing membrane at the tip of the insect. So here are some examples of uh, terrestrial heteroptera, and hopefully in all of those you can see this uh, base or leathery region with the, the differentiated membrane at the tip. So the second main grouping is this sort of fairly unpronounceable mouthful of a word, the orpinarinca. In fact, it's easier to refer to them maybe as leafhoppers and allies, since most of them are actually leafhoppers. Uh, one species that you might be familiar with is this red and black frog hopper, so Copis vulnerata. This can be really common in the spring, has a quite a short season in May or June. Uh, and obviously it's very eye-catching being red and black. They look completely different in appearance. They have uh, a very short antennae with just a few short segments. You can barely see them and they've got this bristle at the end. The wings are uniform, so they don't have this membranous tip uh, and they don't overlap either. So they're just held over around the body like a tent really. So yeah, as I said before, most of these are leaf hoppers and you can recognize leaf hoppers by the parallel rows of spines on the hind leg. So this is the hind leg here and you can see these parallel spines. And these insects, which are leaf hoppers, and this insect here is also a leaf hopper. There are parallel spines. And this is a frog hopper. This is a, a six-eared plant hopper. So these are all Orchinorinca leaf hoppers and allies. And you can see they have these uniform wings, which are, are held over the body like a, a tent. Right, so the final uh, suborder is <coughs> A much more difficult and inaccessible group. These are the Sternorhynchus. So this contains aphid scale insects and psyllids, very, very soft bodied insects, which are difficult to study. You really have to be quite specialized and intricate to get into these. You have to start staining them and squatting body parts, making slides. Difficult um, to identify and quite difficult to, to get into. Um, so these are not going to be included in this talk. This talk will only focus on terrestrial heteroptera, uh, true bugs, and the Orchinorhynchus, the leaf hoppers and allies. And, and I am the LNHS recorder for these two groups. And as Maria has already said, uh, I'm also involved quite heavily with the national recording schemes for terrestrial bugs, uh, in particular the shield bugs and allies, for which I'm the national recorder. So why should we care about these groups, the terrestrial hets and, and or the leaf hoppers and allies? Why, why, should, why are they interesting? Well, first of all, they're really conspicuous and common and, and very easy to find. And if you go into a grassland in the middle of the summer, um, you'll find hundreds of them. And they can be really very, very numerous and quite species rich as well. They're also not terribly difficult to identify, although, uh, well, some are, but they don't have a very difficult reputation, in fact. They don't deserve, perhaps, to have such a difficult reputation. Many are really quite distinctive. Uh, they're taxonomically relatively stable. There's a, a few you know, knotty issues, um, but there are in, in every group, I think. But for the most part, they're OK in that respect. And we know quite a lot about them. In terms of their ecology, we have a good understanding of their host plant associations, uh, their distribution, we have a reasonable handle on, and we also know pretty much how rare they are, um, although there's obviously a lot of scope for improving all those things. In certain habitats, they're really, really good indicators of the quality uh, of those habitats, particularly grasslands, particularly short grasslands and acid grasslands. Um, and also other habitats like wetlands, in fact. They're very under-recorded still, so there's always a lot of scope for personal contribution. This is really um, irrespective of where you live, uh, even in London, southeast, where there's more recorders, you can still 
uh, make some really interesting discoveries. Um, and last not, and not least, they're, they're often very colorful and attractive and um, <clears throat> very engaging uh, insects. Right, so a bit about life cycles, just so you understand what I'm talking about in terms of nymphs and adults. So unlike a lot of insects, like butterflies and moths, beetles and flies, which have a pupil stage and what we call complete metamorphosis, Hemiptera don't. They have incomplete metamorphosis and the young larvae just look like small wingless versions of the adults and we call those nymphs. So this is similar to the situation in Orthoptera, for example, uh, where you also have nymphs. This has implications for their ecology. It usually means they're quite simple. So the, the larval stage, the nymphal stage, the ecology will is pretty much always the same as the adults. And it also means they can be easier to find because if you don't get the timing quite right, you, find, you might find something that you think are the nymphs, so you can come back in a few weeks or a month's time and find the adults, whereas you can never do that with a beetle really, um, or a fly, very much more difficult. There are five nymphal instars between the egg and the adult. So if we uh, <clears throat> think about this species here, which is the juniper shield bug, here we've got the eggs laid on the juniper foliage. We've got, uh, those will hatch to produce early instar nymphs, which will feed, grow, undergo several molts and then the final molt, uh, the, the penultimate molt, sorry, will produce this final instar which has these wing buds here and in the very final molt those wing buds will, uh, from which uh, wings will unfurl from these uh, buds covering the abdomen uh, and you'll produce a fully winged adult. Species will normally overwinter either as eggs or adults, very rarely as nymphs, that's unusual. Right, so feeding strategies, how do these things live? As I said, most of them are plant feeding. Uh, all of the Orchnorinca, the leafhoppers and allies are plant feeding and most of the terrestrial bugs uh, are herbivorous too. So we call that uh, phytophagus mode of nutrition. Uh, and they sucking plant sap with these piercing and sucking mouth parts, the rostrum. But the actual strategy that any species has can vary greatly. So some bugs will be very, very unfussy, highly polyphagous. So this potato capsid here can feed on many host plants in many different families. It's extremely generalist. Uh, this is a, um, a rhombic leather bug. This is polyphagous, but only on plants in one family. So caryophyllaceae, things like pinks um, and uh, campions, those sorts of things. And this is a totally uh, monophagous bug, a very fussy thing, a mistletoe plant bug only found on mistletoe. So very, very specialized. So as well as being totally herbivorous, terrestrial bugs can also be totally predatory, uh, partly predatory or feed on fungi. But none of them feed on dead wood or dung, unlike beetles, it's important to realize that. Right, so that's the sort of end of the general introduction. So I'll now talk a bit more about um, <clears throat> the real subject of the talk. So Hemiptera really are warmth loving. And when you go and look for them, at any, on any site, you'll often find them in the very warmest microhabitats within that area. So these are very often things like south facing slopes, very, very sheltered parts of the site, which are, are really insulated and, and, uh, and warm by the sun. And so they really do like a very nice hot condition at the ground surface. And as you'd expect, the majority of the British fauna are, are, as a result, are found in southern England. And if you go up to Scotland, you will find some specialist species, but generally the species diversity declines uh, quite a lot as you go north. And this has made them really sensitive indicators of climate change. And we've seen a lot of very big range expansions in the last sort of 20 or 30 years. And these are really very lightly linked to gradual climate change. 
Uh, this is often accompanied by a uh, shift onto new host plants. And this phenomenon is called ecological release. And it's so the, the theory is that species are being freed from some sort of pre-existing limiting factor, which uh, in these cases is probably climatic. There have been two sort of general patterns of range expansion that, that, that have occurred. And the first is that species which were traditionally southerly have been moving north. And a great example of this one is the box bug, Gonocerus acuti angulatus. Now you may have heard of this species. It was historically one of the great rarities to occur in the London area. It only occurred at a single site in, in, in Britain, uh, at Box Hill in Surrey. And it was first discovered there in 1850 by Douglas, who was a very famous Victorian entomologist. And it was only found on box. As, as you know, Box Hill is a is, um, very good site for lots of box trees. And this was completely confined to that habitat and that site. And for the next 150 years, loads of entomologists went to, to see this thing and it was the only place you could find it. From about 1990 onwards, people started finding the box bug in other parts of Surrey uh, and outside Box Hill. And interestingly, it seemed to be appearing on other plants, particularly hawthorns and other rosaceous trees. Uh, and switch forward to 2014, uh, and you can see that a massive range expansion has taken place. Uh, and the bug is feeding on uh, a big range of rosaceous shrubs like buckthorn, all the buckthorn, apples and roses. Uh, and it's reached Norfolk, Gloucestershire and Hampshire um, by 2014. And by 2020, uh, even as far north as Lincolnshire, Lancashire um, and Devon in the west. So this is an absolutely unprecedented example of range expansion by what was uh, a massively rare insect. A little bit like what Philanthus triangulum has done, Tony was talking about that earlier, which used to be confined to the Isle of Wight. This is perhaps uh, analogous to that. The second sort of pattern of range expansion is a species that were formerly coastal moving inland. And this is well illustrated by a bug called Chorizus hyasiami, which is it's not a shield bug, but it's closely related to them. And this historically was, was absent from the London area and never present anywhere near it. In fact, it was very local in the southwest and western coasts of Britain. And it was usually found in sand dunes feeding on things like Storksville and Rest Harrow. And from about 2000 onwards, this started to move inland really quickly and appear in all sorts of habitats, including gardens, feeding on lots and lots of different plants. So suddenly this huge, this huge expansion. And I think it was first recorded in London in 2006, Perry Vale Wood. And that was only three years after. Roger Hawkins had written in Shieldbugs of Surrey that the species was not likely to occur in Surrey and presumably meant never likely to occur in Surrey. Um, so, you know, really amazing. And the species has actually reached Scotland now, which I really didn't think would happen uh, that quickly. So another thing that's been happening, as well as range expansions, are new species being added to the British list. So in general, there are, there are sort of three ways that a species can be added um, to, to our fauna. So something can arrive as a genuinely new arrival. It can be discovered here, having been an overlooked resident species, or it can be the result of a taxonomic split. So those are the three general ways, can be difficult to tell sometimes. So in terms of things that we're pretty sure are actual genuinely new arrivals, over 80 species have, have arrived and been added to the fauna uh, in the last 30 years. And there are two methods really by which these things are getting here. They're arriving naturally in an unassisted way. This is just by natural colonization. So adults literally flying from uh, the near continent across the channel, colonizing that way usually following range expansion on the continent, which is often related to climate change. 
in the same way that's happened here, um, or they can arrive in produce uh, via an assisted means. So this is essentially horticultural introductions in plant produce or landscaping. And obviously these species can originate from much further afield. They don't have to come from the near continent. They can come from, from anywhere around the globe. So sometimes it can be really difficult to tell how things have got here. So if we look at the London fauna in a, a sort of wider context, these figures are ballpark approximate figures. They're not gospel. So don't sort of quote me on any of this. I just worked it out roughly. I reckon that about 370 species of terrestrial hets have been recently recorded in London, about 260 leafhoppers and allies. Um, and that, that corresponds to about 70% of the British fauna for the hets and 60% for the Orkin Orinka. So the majority of the British fauna has been recently recorded in, in the London area. And of these, about 60 have been added to the British list since 1990, and over 30 of those were discovered in London, and about 20 are still largely confined to the London area. So it does seem like species do have a tendency to arrive here, and they also have a tendency to persist here, and they may not necessarily go on um, to spread to other parts of Britain. And, and why is this? Well, London, to begin with, is a massive centre of trade, particularly for, well, for everything, but particularly for horticulture. And it's also significantly milder than other parts of southern Britain. So we have this thing called the urban heat island effect. But London is a good place and species at the northern edge of their range. To find a stronghold, a refuge here, it's often quite a hospitable place for them when the rest of the countryside may not be. So I'm just going to go through uh, some sort of case studies now, some interesting species which have uh, arrived in the last 30 years. Um, starting with something, um, well, starting with some shield bugs, which are generally bigger insects and things which you, you can easily see um, without you know, any magnification you could easily come across in your garden. So the first of these is uh, the southern green shield bug. And this are of Irigula. So this is quite similar to our common green shield bug, Palomina. But you'll see that it has these three white spots along the front edge of the scutellum. It also has a very pale wing membrane. Occasionally, it has this really distinctive white tipped form, uh, Torquata, but this is really unusual in Britain. And I've only ever seen it abroad. I think the development of it must be related to climate. So it seems to be more prevalent in, in hot climates. So the adults are a, bit dis are, are a bit similar really to Palomina, but the nymphs are really distinctive, um, very colorful spotted things. And they're much more often recorded actually. Um, so the nymphs, yeah, obviously are much more numerous than the adults as well, usually. So it's perhaps one of the reasons why that's the case. So this species is native to East Africa originally, and it's been introduced worldwide now, and it can be a real pest in the tropics. It's very, very polyphagous and unfussy. It can feed on all sorts of things, including many crops. And it's been arriving in Britain for years, since the 1950s, um, as an accidental import in vegetables. But it never went on to, to establish successfully here, presumably because the winters were too cold. The winter mortality is really strongly related to temperature in this species. And it wasn't until 2003 that nymphs were first found in the wild, and this was in London, and it was the first evidence of breeding in the wild in Britain. And this is the map for 2020, and you can see it's quite well established in the London area. And there's been a bit of range expansion into the, the home counties. It's also started to turn up in other cities, which are presumably warmer, have more trade to them. So it's, nymphs have also been seen in Manchester, Bristol and Liverpool. So it can, can breed in other locations away from London, evidently. Um, 
particularly in 2018, was a very good summer for it. It was hot. Um, and this is most frequently found on runner beans. So particularly people who have allotments are likely to see this. Uh, it obviously is feeding on your beans, but it isn't doing a lot of damage to them, to be perfectly honest. It causes damage in situations where you're growing vegetables under glass because it can produce really big numbers and it's continuously brooded. But in Britain, it's quite limited and doesn't normally cause too many problems. In the winter, the adults like to come indoors sometimes and so they can turn up in houses. And if we look at the records by month, you'll see this big peak uh, in late summer. And this is normally nymphs that people are recording. Uh, so, right, so another species of shield bug, which is turned up a bit later than Nazara, is the mottled shield bug, uh, Raphagasta nebulosa. Now, this looks a little bit like um, dull forms of the Dolichorus baccarum, the hairy shield bug. Uh, can do. Both of them have these pale bands on the antennae and they also have this pale tip to the scutellum here and they have this conic sivum which is this bit around the edge of the insect banded. Um, <clears throat> so those are the characters they share but it's never hairy. You can see the hairs in, in here on the dolly chorus. Never ever hairy. Has these mottled dark spots on the wing membrane and if you look underneath has this spine that points forward between the legs. Uh, and there's another family, the Acanthus somatidae, which contains the hawthorn shield bug, the birch shield bug, the parent bug, and the juniper shield bug. They all have this spine, but other pentatomid shield bugs um, never have this. So this is the only member of the pentatomidae to have this spine. And the adults and nymphs feed on trees. They feed on quite a big range of deciduous trees. And this was first found at Raynham in 2010, and it had been expanding its range on the continent for some time. And now it's quite well established in London, particularly along the, the Thames Corridor. And this, this sort of scatter of records away from the London area, particularly up here in the Northwest, uh, almost certainly re reflects independent introductions in, in horticultural um, produce. And these records on the south coast uh, are almost certainly immigrant bugs flying across the channel. So this is probably coming in in, in, in several different ways, um, both as, as a, a stowaway in produce and, and as an immigrant. It is quite an unobtrusive thing for a large shield bug, and it's, it's fairly under-recorded, I suspect. Um, and you, you tend to find it more by beating and sweeping than by just, just looking for it. Uh, so yeah, it can be can be quite difficult to find, um, and the adults again do sometimes overwinter indoors. So it's possible to find them in your house, but but not terribly usual. I've not had that many records. Another shield bug, which is fairly similar in appearance to uh, Raphagaster superficially, and quite easily confused with it. I'll go into the, how you identify it in a minute, um, is the brown marmorated shield bug. And this is, you may be familiar with this, you may have heard of it as it's called the brown marmorated stink bug in America. And it's, it's regarded as a really bad pest, in fact. It's native to Asia, uh, and it's been introduced into North America and, and all over parts of continental Europe. Uh, Italy and Switzerland, it's been a real problem for the fruit industry, it's really polyphagous and it can actually be quite a serious economic pest. Uh, things like apple and pear trees, but also other soft fruits like uh, raspberries and even legumes as well. Um, and it's also a pest in that adults really love entering buildings in the winter. They form really big nuisance aggregations potentially as well, which, which can be a problem. So this has been arriving in Britain uh, as a, a stowaway, just a, a, as in, in turn isolated occurrences for about the last 10 years. Uh, and it's been intercepted by DEFRA on several occasions, but it's never established here. Um, however, there have been more records recently and DEFRA were sufficiently concerned to set up a network of pheromone traps across the country. 
um, which would attract males is a very good way of monitoring uh, for a species which is only present at low densities. And several have been found by that method. And we do now think that it's probably becoming established. Uh, and the climate modeling suggests that uh, as, as has happened in several European cities, uh, London area is going to be particularly suitable for it to become established because it, it is so much milder. But in the short term, it's still unclear whether it will be a serious pest here. Obviously, if we, if we, uh, if we get a good sort of wine industry going in this country going forward, maybe it could be a, a big pest, it could be a pest of fruit as well, but in the short term, probably not. So how do you identify it? It is quite similar to uh, Raphigaster nebulosa, the mottled shield bug, but it doesn't have the spine on the underside. A really good way, uh, if you can get a good, very good look at it, a good photo, is it has this little tiny pale tooth behind the eye, at the base of the pronotum, and that is absolutely characteristic. It also has really square, parallel sided head. Um, it's a bit comparative, but yes, also a good feature. If it has dark markings on the wings, they're never spots, they're sort of linear marks. It's never hairy. Um, the nymphs are very spiny actually, and quite different to anything else and more distinctive. So this, this is a, a notifiable pest and potential sightings do need to be reported to uh, the RHS or, or NIAB, the National Institute for Agricultural Botany. Um, but if you put sighting as an eye record, um, I'll pass them on as well. So, so any route will do for that species. Another uh, shield bug, which has really only turned up in the last 10 years or so, is the white shouldered shield bug, Dyrodiris. And this is a a really nice sort of chocolate colored species with these white edges on the pronotum, very widespread in Europe, feeding on bed straws. And this was first found at Perryvale Woods, 2013. And it's, there's been a lot of records from that area since then, uh, and the Horsen and Hill area as well. Um, but it's still pretty uncommon, either that or it's not being found by recorders because the, the only other record is one from Croydon. It's become established in Southampton as well. I possibly could have come off a, a, off a boat maybe there, I don't know. Um, but the fact that it feeds on bed straws to me suggests that it, it may have established naturally. Um, it must be more widespread in London. So I'd really like to get more records of this. And something that's even more unmistakable uh, and you may well have seen on your holidays abroad is the striped shield bug. Uh, Graphosoma italicum, which is unmistakable red and black striped species. It feeds on umbellifers. And this was found during 2020 in the London area in the Lee Valley, uh, Fisher's Green, and at Banstead Common in Surrey. Uh, adults were found feeding on hemlock and hogweed. And these do seem to be the first breeding colonies ever recorded on, on the mainland. But it's really ubiquitous on the continent and very, really, very much long overdue as a a British species. Now, some confusion regarding the nomenclature here. So you may see the species referred to as, as Graphosoma lineatum, but in fact, the British species and the Northern European species and Central European species is Italicum. And lineatum is actually a Mediterranean thing now. So this is Italicum. Um, unfortunately, Italicum is not yet in the species dictionary. So on I record, uh, you can record this, but you have to use lineatum uh, for that. This is something that's been around for a long time, a myriad bug called Derechoris flavillinia, and it's really done very, very well indeed. It's first found in London in 1996, I think sort of Tottenham area, um, following a very well-documented expansion on the continent. And... <clears throat> It's everywhere now, it's all over England and it's even in parts of Scotland, it's just, just got there in the last year or two. It feeds on field maple and sycamore and it's sexually dimorphic. So the males are quite dark with this pale edge to the 
pronotum. The females are a uh, sort of reddish brown, orange color. This, again, this is quite a big plant bug. This is another plant bug, um, similar sort of size, slightly smaller. Again, it's sexually dimorphic, but it's quite variable. It's a species called Clostrotomus trivialis. The males usually blackish with this red cuneus, and the cuneus is this bit of the wing here between the membrane and the rest of the forewing. It's uh, triangular, so it's red in, in the male and green in the female. And this is native to the Mediterranean, and it can be a pest of olives there, um, but <clears throat> it's not really been reported as a pest anywhere else. It was first found in London in 2008, and it was all, all the first records were in gardens, and it was clearly feeding on, on ornamental plants of some kind. But in fact, it's very, very polyphagous, and it's, it almost immediately moved into uh, natural habitats as well, and quickly became very well established. And it's almost certainly got here uh, as a horticultural introduction, I would have thought. And, this, and its subsequent appearance in other cities suggests sort of history of repeat introduction. So it's been found in Liverpool, Oxford, Birmingham, uh, Norwich and, and Sheffield, and even recently in Belfast and Edinburgh. So it's definitely coming in uh, with produce, I would think. And it's got an amazingly wide climatic tolerance for a Mediterranean species. Um, so like most things, uh, which are, well, most other plant bugs, it's overwintering as eggs, but it's appearing in London as early as May, which is incredibly fast and early for something uh, which develops from eggs. So most of our mirrored bugs are species of high summer, June, July. Um, so if a Mediterranean species can appear as early as May, that really indicates very, very quick development, which is, I find really surprising. Uh, another mirrored bug, plant bug, which is from America uh, and has turned up in London the last 10 years is this thing called Tropidosteptes. Now this feeds on ash trees uh, and I found it at Ali Pali in 2012. And there's not been that many records since that, in fact, um, but I'm sure it's out there. I'm sure um, it's just underreported. And it was first found in Europe, in Holland, in 2007, and it probably came in on ornamental ash trees uh, to Britain via trees imported from Holland. And this, in fact, is possibly one of the same pathways of introduction that the ash dieback disease uh, came into Britain. Again, this is a slightly dimorphic species. The males and females look uh, slightly different. This is something that you might have heard of. It was in the news quite extensively uh, at the time. Um, when it was discovered, which was around about 2006, 2007, um, it was widely publicized um, by Max Barclay, who was interested in it because it was very, very common in the gardens of the Natural History Museum, feeding on the plane trees, the seeds of the plane trees there. Uh, and of course, London has had London, uh, London Plains for several centuries, but it wasn't until 2006 that something actually arrived to feed on these super abundant food resource that is the, uh, the, the huge seed balls they produce. Anyway, this bug turned up and, and it was massively abundant. Um, and they were literally covering lots of the surfaces in the garden um, very, very quickly. and. <clears throat> Max got quite interested in it and in fact it was misidentified to begin with um, as a, a different species of Aracatus but we now think it is Aracatus longiceps and it's very probably a horticultural introduction from Europe so it's come from Mediterranean southeast Europe probably and it's really very well established in London now because there are obviously plane trees more or less everywhere and even in the winter you can find it really easily you just peel off um, a bit of loose bark, which is e really easily done on a plane tree, and you'll find um, adults underneath um, with ease normally. It's also turned up outside London, uh, Cambridge and Oxford, where there are also planes, and in fact it could turn up on, on plane trees anywhere, I think. 
another bug which feeds on the seeds of trees and has only recently got here is Octocarinus modestus. This was this turned up in Hyde Park fairly recently, um, and um, it was also found in the Olympic Park last year. And it likes feeding on quite heat stressed alders, and it feeds on uh, on the developing cones. And again, it's something which has probably um, got here naturally following range expansion on the continent because it's been noted to be spreading uh, on the continent. Um, although it's, it could also be a horticultural introduction, it's a bit difficult to tell really with this one. Now this species is not a new arrival, but it's uh, an interesting one to discuss uh, in that it, 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 it illustrates the difficulty um, that we have when we talk about native and non-native species. So this is a, a ground bug called Eremochoris fenestratus. And this used to be a great rarity in Britain. It was only found in the Chilterns feeding on juniper bushes. Um, and it was very uncommon and only a few entomologists recorded it there and it wasn't seen since the 1960s. And in 2010, it was found in West London at a couple of sites. And obviously there was no juniper there. It was associated with cypress trees. And it seemed like these, these new records must refer to the recent colonists which had come in from, from the continent, presumably uh, in horticultural produce. And it was then found more widely at other sites uh, across the country. Uh, so it does seem to have been an introduction. And so you have this, um, this curious situation where we have a native species which has gone extinct um, before being reintroduced and switching to a non-native food plant. So it's just a nice, a nice uh, example of the difficulty sometimes of distinguishing, distinguishing between native and non-native species. It can become um, very complicated and sometimes almost a bit arbitrary. Right, so I'm going to move on to a few examples now of uh, the Orcanorinca, the leaf hoppers and allies. And this is a species called the mosaic leaf hopper, Orientus ishidae. It's a really spectacular, um, checkered, colourful hopper. And this was first found in, in Warwick Gardens in Peckham um, by Penny Frith, who you may know, uh, has, has spent a large part of her life documenting the insect fauna of that park. Um, and this is a hopper that is native to Asia, but it's been introduced to North America and Europe, and it feeds on various deciduous trees. Its arrival here is almost certainly a um, result of, of uh, horticultural introduction, and it's now well established in London. Um, but there are a couple of records outside the London area, probably um, in tree nurseries um, and near tree nurseries. There are some records from Cambridge um, and, and Bristol as well, I think. It can come to light and turns up inside houses and, and also turns up in moth traps. So it's worth looking out for if you're um, recording moths. This is another leaf hopper, which is quite distinctive. It's got a really pointed head and it's got quite sort of transparent hyaline forewings called Japanenus hyalinus. And this is another Asian native, but again, it's been introduced into Europe and it's associated with, with maples, particularly Japanese maple, Acer palmatum, which is an ornamental uh, Acer that people often have in their gardens. And it's almost certainly a horticultural introduction. And this was first recorded in Cambridge, but in fact, most records since then have been from a London area. So definitely worth checking if you have Acer palmatum in your garden, well worth having a look for this. Another leaf hopper, it's a very small species. Um, if you have sage growing in your garden, you may have a species called the sage leaf hopper, Euptrix melissii, but even smaller than that insect, which is only, the melissii is only sort of three millimeter long. Slightly smaller than that, sort of two and a half millimeters is Euptrix decimnotator. And this also feeds on sage, um, but it's 
a bit smaller. It's got slightly different markings on the head. Uh, and it's a horticultural introduction from the Mediterranean, probably. It was first found in London in about 2002. Um, but now it's, it's fairly widespread in much of England um, and has even reached parts of Wales and Scotland. That's something that's definitely worth looking for if you have sage or, or mint uh, in your garden. Another species, which is uh, a leafhopper, sometimes called the bay leafhopper, Cynothropsis laurei, is the sort of medium sized brown leafhopper. And it's usually found on bay laurel, but sometimes also on ivy. It's an interesting combination of host plants because they're not really related. Um, and it's almost certainly an introduction, horticultural introduction from the med um, coming in on imported bay trees. And it was first found in London um, 2007. It seems to be well established now. And as it's on bay, it's often in parks and gardens. And you can see there are some other recent records from other cities, southern England. So this does suggest sort of independent introduction uh, on, on bay trees. So something that was just found very, very recently uh, is this uh, leafhopper called Penistragania. Now, interestingly, although it's a very recent discovery, it's probably been here quite a long time. So this is a species native to the USA and it's specifically found on the honey locust tree, Gladitsia which is a, a really spiny tree actually, um, and very difficult to sort of sample with a net because of these large, large hard spines. And it produces big seed pods, it's a leguminous tree. Uh, and it has been quite widely planted in London and, and other European cities. And people started finding this, this leafhopper um, on honey locust in Europe about 10 years ago. Uh, and it was recently found in Holland. Uh, and I thought it, it had to be present in, in Britain by now. And in fact, as soon as I looked for it, I found it, which suggests to me that it could have been here a lot longer. So although it, it does seem to be a fairly recent colonist, it could have been here um, possibly for as long as a decade. So that just shows, you know, it's very easy to overlook things. Um, and, you know, you do need to, <clears throat> you do need to stay on the ball. And if things are turning up in Holland, they're, they're generally likely to get here or, or already be here, in fact. Right, so just to sum up um, and provide a bit of future perspective, um, London is, is a really uh, interesting and exciting place to record bugs. And there are still a lot of species that are present here that are not really found in many other places outside the LNHS area. Um, a sort of general theme that you may have got from this talk is that a lot of these newly arrived species are really unfussy creatures. They're generalist. They're usually quite polyphagous, feeding on lots and lots of different plants. So although they're interesting in a British context, in a British context, they tend to be kind of really successful, widespread cosmopolitan things. Um, which are found all, in all sorts of other places away from Britain and will often be described very unflatteringly as kind of trash species by European workers or, or workers abroad. The other thing to take away is that most of them really don't have much of a detrimental ecological impact. They're pretty benign. So for every brown marmorated shield bug, you'll have a multitude of things which really don't cause any harm whatsoever and just slot into a, a niche and, and don't, and, and bear it without registering any kind of impact at all. Um, what is clear is that going forward with climate change, London will become increasingly suitable for more and more of these sorts of new arrivals. But what is less certain is whether the horticultural trade will sort of keep pace with that. Um, obviously we've seen massive um, trade in plants in the past, but in fact, post Brexit, that may um, that may be slightly limited. There might be more restrictions um, between us and the EU. Something to bear in mind, perhaps. Um, I know that when we were still in the EU, there was more or less unrestricted movement of plants between the member states. 
Um, that may now be changing. And finally, of course, if you want to find out any more about any of the species featured here, most of them are covered on the British Bugs website. Um, so have a look at that. And just a final plea, um, please do contribute your records, put them on iRecord, um, and particularly if you think you found uh, something like the brown marmorated shield bug, that is important to log records to that. And of course, anything, any, any of the other species, um, you will find a dedicated email address for that species. But as I said, you can also um, put it on iRecord or contact the RHS. Um, and <clears throat> that concludes my talk. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tristan, and your voice held out really well. So that's brilliant, um, too. That was just a really fascinating talk. And I like the way you went through several of the different kind of case studies and really sort of understanding what's happening to these species, how they're expanding. And one thing I wanted to ask a little bit more about was about the coastal species So I could sit and why, why are they why is their range expanding? Because I can see obviously like the northward movement with, um, you know, the kind of warming climate. What's what's causing that shift from them, you know, move? what's helping them to move inland? Well, I, I think the thing with the coastal species is that they tend to, coastal species tend to like south facing coasts, which can be really, really warm. So right sand dune systems that face south, soft cliffs. They're often very warm microclimates and habitats that those species are living in anyway. So, so things that are coastal tend to be living in warm microclimates. And when the climate warms, generally, they are then able to move inland into more general habitats. Um, so, so generally, the coastal species are not they're not exploiting north facing coastal areas mm. they they tend to be just on the on the really south facing sloping or or yeah things like sand dunes which warm up mm. a lot mm. um yeah so so yes that's the reason things that are already coastal um things that are only coastal are already very climate limited or or climate mm. limited to some extent in britain yeah, yeah, thank you. That 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 kind of makes sense because I'm kind of thinking about say you know, things like salting and saline species, what's going on with plants, and obviously it's kind of something that's quite different, but it, again, it's a kind of it's climate, you know, again, mm. it's a sort of climate related movement. Well, yeah, thank with you. yeah, with 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 bugs, it tends to be a lot more about the microclimate mm. and the condition of the plant rather than the presence of the plant. So so they really what they're like is a warm microclimate and stressed plant so so that's why these things are telling you more about mm. a site than just the botany mm. you know so so you know if 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 all if all the if all the bugs told you about a site was what the plants you know what plants they were feeding on um then they wouldn't be useful but they're telling you a lot more than what plants are there they're telling you about the microclimates those plants are growing in and the, and the condition that those plants are in, whether they're, you know, whether they're stressed. So, for example, you're never going to find that um, at alder feeding bug in a, in a lovely wetland where mm -hmm. the alders are all lush and unstressed. It's mm -hmm. going to be growing in a kind of, you know, transitional dry grassland where the alder is completely knackered and um, having a hard time. So, so that's what these things are telling you, basically, and that's what they like. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So it's like it's not great for the alder, but it's no, obviously great for the bugs. Ab no, <laughs> absolutely not. Yeah. And and some sometimes you don't sometimes you can't when you find a bug, sometimes you can't find the host plant because because it's feeding on little tiny scraps of really mm. stressed plant. Mm. You know. Um so and you'll go and you'll, sometimes you'll go looking for something and you'll look at you'll think, oh, I need to find the host plant. So you'll find the host plant, but it will be not stressed enough <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah thank you I'm, I'm conscious there's quite a few things in the chat I don't know if we've got time to get through all of the questions but if we can just pick up one or two Anka is there a couple of things that you could kind of pick up for us yeah um I mean some of the questions were helpfully answered by Tristan in his talk um 
but there were a couple more that came up. So one is from Mick Massey. How do bugs defend themselves and are they toxic to predators? Um, yeah, so bugs have this, uh, particularly the uh, heteroptera, have um, volatile organic chemicals which they can excrete. Uh, and these evaporate very, very quickly from uh, um, an, a special area of their exoskeleton, which has a huge surface area. So it evaporates off very, very quickly. And, and this is um, a sort of repugnatorial fluid and it evaporates really fast and it, it repels predators. Um, but they're not, they're not essentially poisonous. They're, they're, they're distasteful really. So a predator would, we, wouldn't be poisoned by eating one, but it probably wouldn't want to repeat the experience. Well, that's probably good as well. Um, and then Ralph Hobbs was asking, could you update us on recent firebug records in the UK, if possible? Yeah, um, firebug is a really interesting one. So the, the, the firebug distribution seems to be sort of consolidating now. And, and I have a theory in that this is due to the bug being able to develop long winged forms now in Britain. So previously it was it, long winged forms, which can obviously disperse and fly. Uh, they were never found in Britain. And so the firebug distribution was just a series of colonies, which were all the result of local introductions. Uh, and so they were very patchy and um, rather scattered. It seems now that the distribution is, is joining up uh, along the south, southeast coast at least. And, and I think this is because long wing forms can be produced here. So they're actually being able to move around a lot more uh, and colonize uh, suitable habitats. And of course, they're not limited by uh, much else. They're, they're quite unfussy um, in terms of their, their host plant is mallow. So, there's loads of potentially suitable sites for them. Uh, and so I think they're, I think there's something that's going to really, really become common maybe in the next decade. They should really start sort of taking off and um, yeah, we'll start seeing certainly in the Southeast, a really big area being occupied by them. Um, Tony was um, actually following on from Mick's question. He said, do we know of selective avoidance of alien species by our native bug hunting wasps? That's, uh, that's a very interesting question. I know, no, um, as, far, as far as I'm aware, um, there's no evidence of that. Uh, and I, I don't think that that kind of data has been gathered yet. I mean, I've certainly never seen any of these non-native species being predated by anything really. Um, I do have some records where the, where the predator has been noted, um, but not any of the not any of the species I, I've I was talking about today. I mean the, the bug hunting wasps, so things like um, data boops, which stocks its nest burrow with with bug nymphs. Yeah, very interesting question. I don't know that that possibly would possibly would use um, some of the species that we've, we've talked about today, yeah. But there's no, uh, uh, to my knowledge, there is no um, actual records of that yet. That sounds like something kind of that's worth future study. So I'm sure Tony will be kind of interested in maybe some of that, you know, you, you could kind of follow up as well. But yeah, really kind of interesting question. Um, um, we're going to have to draw it to a close there because we've over, overrun a little bit, but it's kind of been really interesting. Um, I just want to say, you know, once again, thank you so much for coming and sharing all your expertise with us. I will send out um, an email to people who've kind of registered with a, and I'll put the British Bugs link on. Is there a kind of anything like a, a, a book or anything else that you kind of recommend for people who are kind of interested, or is that website perhaps, perhaps a, a good, the best place to start? 
I think the website's a good place to start in terms of, yeah, your first port of call. And um, yeah, there's, there's, there's plenty of information um, out there. I mean, books are something that are still, there's no comprehensive um, books, unfortunately. There, there, there are good, very good general insect guides which cover a lot of bugs um, in, in, you know, quite, well, not comprehensively, but to, to a good, to a good level. Um, Paul, Paul Brock's books, um, in fact, I would, I would recommend that. That has a lot of, a lot of bugs in it. Um, but yeah, that's just a real problem going forward is, is producing something uh, to cover the British fauna. But it, it's, it's something for the future, I'm afraid that. Yeah, th thanks. And, you know, maybe there's a kind of potential there for you to be kind of producing something, maybe? Yeah, I mean, we um, definitely need to get some key. I mean, there are keys out there. We need to get them um, published in some some shape or form, certainly. Yeah, um, that's great. So, yeah, anyway, so there's plenty, plenty to be done and obviously plenty, you know, kind of for people who are interested to, to kind of do in terms of recording. Really fascinating to see what's happening to... Uh, you know, and it's really like a, a, a sizable increase in numbers of species and, you know, things happening quite rapidly um, so that, you know, plenty for kind of people to explore. And it's nice that London's such a good place to study them as well. That's pretty yeah, I mean, L London is really interesting. I mean, unusually, there haven't been any new species for Britain in London this year. But that's un that's that is the, the exception, you know, uh, um, the norm is that there's a new species arriving um, in London, which is new to Britain every year, yes, at amazing. least one. So, yeah. It's, yeah. So thank you once again. And, no, you're, um, you're welcome.